Chapter 2. Spain. To St. Albans with Philby. The Spanish Civil War ground to a bloody halt in March 1939. I left Cambridge in May and spent the early part of the summer rowing at Henley. After participating in the Henley Regatta and winning a couple of races, I sailed to Spanish shores for the summer holidays while waiting for a job in Chile or Canada as a trainee timber company manager. I thought of being a vet due to my love of horses, but when I was told how long it takes, I decided against it. When the inevitable world war was declared, I realised it was not going to be a job in Chile or Canada. I felt I should join up, but the bureaucratic blockade characteristics of the dictatorial state after the Civil War delayed my being permitted to leave the country, and so I lost my place for an immediate commission. Permission to leave was eventually granted, and I was invited to escort three middle-aged ladies to Madrid. I left the house in Sotiel Coronada on October the 3rd, never to see it again as my beloved home. Francisco drove us to Seville, the bustling, beautiful station echoing with childhood memories of school trips. Again, the painful goodbye to my parents on the platform. Those fateful steps onto the night train to Madrid. This time, I was going to war. Steam and whistles filled the air and my train slowly pulled out of the beautiful station with the ironwork framing the glass roof. The ten-hour journey through war-torn southern Spain brought us under the glass dome of Madrid's Atocha station, which had been shattered in the Civil War. Madrid was a shell of its former glory. Guardia civil uniforms casually wandered around. Very few cars and some horse carriages moved along the streets. People on the streets were all shopping at the stalls that farmers set up to sell fruit and vegetables. The surviving hotels were glad for any business. A regal reception followed at the sumptuous Hotel Nacional. I spent a night thinking of what I was leaving behind, mixed with feelings of fear and excitement, or where I was going. Fear due to the scenes of devastation en route to Madrid, and excitement as it seemed the right thing to do. After this restless night, I met three ladies for breakfast and escorted them onto the train, taking us to the border town of Irun. I have to admit, in their own English way, they kept me amused and somewhat alleviated my depression. Like their what seemed petty concerns of how they would wash their stockings if there were no water in the hotel, and had they bought enough clothes for the dinner parties they might attend. On a grander scale, one of them was worried whether she was going to be good enough to drive a tractor on a farm where she was going to work in the land army. The countryside north of Madrid added to the trepidation I was feeling. The war damage was far more evident north of Madrid than to the south. It was pockmarked by shell holes and empty trenches that wound their snake-like courses amongst barbed wire and twisted tanks and trucks. If this is the aftermath of war, again I ask myself, what am I doing? As we slowly rattled northwards, the clear scars of war were everywhere. The dangling power lines, broken telegraph poles, bomb-shattered houses, and gunshots that pockmarked all the stations and houses I could see from the train. My question was echoed to me every kilometre we travelled. The arrival at the French frontier thankfully gave me something to do, bringing me out of my gloom. Shepherding the ladies from one country to another was no problem, but the luggage was a different story. There were no porters or trolleys. The scene presented a sort of climax. There we were with piles of luggage, leaving Spain, a country ravaged by the effects of civil war, setting foot onto France, about to become the centre stage of the European element of the Second World War. I, on the French side, was bustling, organised and almost felt normal, except for the hordes of young men in uniform carrying guns. I enjoyed the buffet goodies of French pastries and coffee during our short wait. The train, twice its normal length, smelt of sweat and, though full to the brim, was very quiet. 
One can sense the anxiety and fear and the hundreds of different stories occupying the minds behind all those strangers' eyes. Being brought together under such circumstances played havoc with our lives and imaginations. We drew away from Hondai at 2am. The crisp morning air of that 5th of October helped ease the cramped conditions. The frequent stops to pick up conscripted poilu, in uniform and armed heading north to the front, made me feel more and more like a Spanish sardine and confident the war would be over by Christmas. Except the image of the German uniforms and the arrogant pride and efficiency displayed at the Olympic Games made me wonder if the powers that be knew what these young men were up against. Food was a problem. At Angoulême, I clambered out of the train, walked around the station where I managed to acquire six croissants, a few bananas and a bottle of water from the crowded station buffet. As I wandered onto the opposite platform, my train started to pull out, panic struck. Holding onto the supplies, I ran for it, only to have my path cut by a goods train. Without thinking, I jumped out onto the buffers between two of the moving wagons, hopped across the coupling and down to the other side. As I made a grab for the handle on the last carriage of my train, it stopped. The bag with the bananas dropped to the floor. I picked them up in a hurry and made my way through the crowded passages. In Paris, where the can-can was still kicking, restaurants still cooking, the café au lait flowing, and the people full of joie de vie, we transferred to the boat train. Finally, we arrived at Victoria Station, London. I was surprised to find London, where I stayed for one night, being far from being full of joie de vie. Sandbags were covering basement windows and doorways. Watchmen with tin helmets were everywhere. The following morning, I caught the train to Cambridge and went to the university recruiting office. Apparently, there were no vacancies. It really seemed that I had lost my place, having been delayed from leaving Spain. There were no vacancies for me in the war, and I was instructed to come back every two or three days. Strange, thinking of it now, that I had to wait to join the war. To fill in time and save money, I coached rowing and lived in Magdalene College for three weeks. At the end of the third week, having been rejected again and again, I decided to go on and see my girlfriend Betty, who lived near Worcester, where I secured lodgings and drove tractors through the winter of 1939-1940. Betty joined the Land Army on the farm that Christmas. On the 27th of February 1940, I trudged through the snow to Worcester Station and caught the train to London, took the underground train to Westminster, walked to the war office where I worked my way through security checks, piled up sandbags and approached the colour sergeant in charge of volunteers. I explained about missing my commission due to the hold-ups in Spain and then my waiting in Cambridge. He looked me straight in the face and asked... What do you want me to do about it, young man? Well, I'm, I'm bored, I'm broke and I want to join up and I was wondering if you might have any vacancies in this war, I replied. Two weeks later, I was marching in the ranks of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Regiment. Many of the young lads who did not know their left foot from their right. There were four of us with university education in my barracks and we quickly became caretakers. Writing letters to parents and girlfriends was often an enjoyable benefit of being educated. One individual would compose letters of incredible passion to his girlfriend in Banbury. Darning socks and sewing buttons on tunics was one of the drawbacks. Promotion to corporal was soon followed by my transfer to Bloody Bulford Officers Training Camp. Sergeant Davis was not the bullying sergeant I had expected. On the contrary, he was a fairly soft-spoken man whose main duty was to get us fit, which he did. At Bloody Bullford, I became the chess opponent of Leo Long, who nearly always beat me. Leo Long became famous for being another agent recruited by Anthony Blunt to work for the Russians before the war. During the war, he worked in MI14, military intelligence responsible for analysing German military intentions. I was subjected to drill trainings, part of the price of being in the infantry. After a week of intensive drill and field exercises, I took some leave to see Betty. During my wait for the connecting train to Oxford, I was standing on the platform 
when a hospital train with wounded from Dunkirk pulled in. The horror of war struck me as hundreds of young men like me limped and hobbled, many on crutches or carried on stretchers, with arms or legs missing and bloody bandages around their faces and eyes. Many who could walk but not see would help those who could see but not walk easily. Slowly they moved down the platform. Nurses guided them to the waiting ambulances. Suddenly, the idea of being a member of the infantry lost its appeal. Thankfully, on my return, I was asked to attend an interview. Several interviews later, I became a lieutenant in the British Intelligence Corps. My training at Oxford was only interrupted by trips on my Matches 500 motorcycle to see Betty. During this time, the Germans had overrun France and the Blitz had started, both of which demonstrated the might of the German Army and Air Force. For many days, London was ablaze. Coventry and other major cities were hit, causing a feeling of resilience and stiff upper lip, and a deep down feeling we might not win this war. Along with the other officers in my section of the intelligence corps, we all agreed Chamberlain had been an old fuddy-duddy and too weak a person to lead Britain. We also discussed the old guard in the army and their need to wake up out of their superior sleep. We were very aware of how under-equipped the infantry was. Many rifles were the same as had been used in the First World War. We had no tanks to speak of, and our air force was outdated. The country needed to wake up and get to making weapons. We hoped that Winston Churchill and his connections with America through his mother, he might persuade the US to join in. Training consisted of learning all about enemy uniforms, hand weapons, tanks, airplanes, ships, habits and the German way of life. This new knowledge just confirmed what advanced military machines we were up against. We needed to deceive England's population that the army were well equipped. This was not part of my job directly, but I was asked to suggest that we had modern weapons on the factory floors. In April 1941, my appointment as an instructor on the Spanish and Portuguese armies bewildered me since I thought I was only slightly less ignorant on the subject than the rest of our defence establishment. Not the case. Actually, my constant travelling back and forth to Spain had given me a knowledge, which I only came to realise when I tapped into it. I translated many military slogans and technical terms from Spanish army into English. The concern at the time was the Spanish might decide to help Hitler, since Franco had received arms and aid from Hitler during the Civil War. I was sure this would never happen. For the first year of the war, I would receive letters from my father, who was still in Spain. He would inform me that the mines were going to be taken over by the Spanish and nationalised. My father, through his contacts in the arms industry, the mining industries and with some local Spanish politicians, just confirmed as to how devastated and exhausted Spain was. It was clear that Franco's main concern was to rebuild Spain and had no desire, the energy or interest in being part of another war. I moved from Oxford to be stationed at Cambridge where I felt quite at home. The work was rather boring and office bound, but the security of the job encouraged me to propose. On the 18th of May 1941, Betty and I were married. After a few more months of lecturing, followed by promotion to captain, I started to feel as though my potential and my language talents were being wasted. There was only so much one could say about the Spanish and Portuguese armies. They were under-equipped and not very fit. The Spanish were exhausted, having suffered very badly during the Civil War, and the Portuguese, well, <laughs> they were Portuguese. <laughs> I gave my arguments as to why I felt Spain would stay neutral, suggesting the Portuguese were far more likely to help the Germans than the Spanish. The only impediment to the popular German feeling amongst the Portuguese people was the Anglo-Portuguese Treaty of 1373, which still stands today and is the oldest treaty between two nations. 
One day, a gentleman from the war office came to see me. I met him in a back room. Richard Brumham White, who explained briefly about the need for Spanish-speaking officers. He asked a couple of what seemed irrelevant questions and generally chatted. It was arranged for me to go to London, to the war office, to meet Lieutenant Colonel Calgill, who wanted to interview me. I made the trip on my motorbike. I parked up next to a pile of sandbags. I showed my pass to the watchman, who told me I could put it behind the sandbags, just in case. No sooner had I pushed my mattress behind the pile of bags, removed my gloves and leather helmet and goggles, than a young man came out of the main entrance. I was ushered into a large office where Lieutenant Colonel Felix Calgill was sitting behind his large oak desk. He told me to sit down at the chair in front of his desk. The corporal who brought me in took my helmet, gloves and leather jacket and offered me a coffee. As soon as he left, Cowgill fired questions at me about my fluency in Spanish and my knowledge of the country. Sitting behind the colonel was a pleasant-looking civilian, taking notes and obviously studying me very carefully. The civilian asked me one question. What fears do you have of this war? One of my answers was being bombed and the other was of losing the war. The colonel turned to the civilian who nodded at him. The colonel turned back to me and asked, How would you like to work on a rather secret project? Anything to get my backside out of the seat in the office at Cambridge, I replied. On the 3rd of September, I found myself the passenger in a car going to St Albans, the driver being the pleasant-looking civilian. He immediately put me at my ease and offered me a cigarette. After some preliminary chit-chat about the traffic and times at Cambridge, he started to explain where we were going and what we would be doing. I noticed he had a slight stammer. The old mansion... Glen Almond, headquarters of Section 5, is where you're going to be working with me in the Iberian sector of the Counterintelligence Department, MI6. There'll be about half a dozen of us collecting all the information uh, we can about German movements in in Spanish-speaking countries, including South America. As I watched the green countryside dashing past the car window, I thought to myself, I'm in the Secret Service. This is exciting. The sun shining through the hedge grows reminded me of the sunbeams in the old flour mill at my home in Spain. By the way, I know you know my name, but anyway, how do you do? I'm Desmond Bristow. I informally introduced myself as we arrived at St Albans. The driver, throwing his cigarette out of the window, looked at me with a slight stutter and replied, How do you do, Desmond? I'm, I'm Kim Philby. My father would often talk about Philby as being a very good friend and obviously had a great deal of respect for him at that time. Despite the revelation of his one-time friend being the notorious third man and a traitor who worked for the KGB even before the war, my father was able to keep clear how he felt towards Kim during the time that they worked together. Perhaps this power that Philby was able to have over his friends and colleagues is what enabled him to get away with his treachery for as long as he did.